Okay, where does, okay. Let's do, this is nerve wracking. Okay, I don't want to stand in front of it. Um, so I, I put the title of my talk as Welcome Back Bitches, which was genuinely meant to be a working title. And then I sent it to Steve and realized I never changed it. Um, but I, you know, actually it's, you'll, like you'll see, it will, it will make more sense in a minute. So anyway, I'm Kristen and I'm a PhD researcher at Queen Mary, which is really fun and technically a geographer, but we're totally not gonna get into the, disciplines of history and geography, because that will just take forever. Um, and actually, a little while ago, Rachel Suhomi, who's already told me she doesn't remember this, told me that I should do a history show offset about my research, my PhD, and I was like, I don't think that's gonna work. I can't really think about how my research is gonna be funny, because I research things like plague-infested testicles, <laughs> and I look at a lot of like elephantiasis-infected hands or eye worms. Um, I, obviously, everyone's doing penis jokes tonight. <laughs> Mine are plague-infested testicles. Um, and I, I was actually gonna... <laughs> I was actually gonna put up a picture of this eye infection in a person. It's called African eye worm, and even I thought it was too gross. Was like, there's, no, there's no way I'm doing that. And it just didn't seem funny. Oh, you guys are laughing, they're obviously sickos, but it didn't seem like a good idea. But then I came up... I came across something new, and I thought, well, actually, maybe people might relate to that. And I had the idea to, to do some work on both books I was reading about how how people who British people who are living in India were in the empire enjoying themselves what should they do when they come back to London well, what's the advice for life living in London I thought yeah you know that could work um, so this is this is a part of my broader research which is called imperial medicine in the global city came up with that myself right? um, and basically I'm just looking at the interactions between the empire and London in the late 19th century and just looking at how that shaped the history of medicine just a basically trying to change the idea that, you know, the Brits came out with everything and then sent it out, um, and maybe thinking more about what came back, like, you know, drugs, for example, like, you know, those eye infections and, like, leprosy. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, a lot of leprosy, that's mainly what people were writing about that time period. That's gross. But, you know, people, people came back. They went out and they came back for, you know, lots of different reasons. Lots of kids came home to go to school, or maybe you are on furlough, so you're just having a good time in the city, or maybe you're sick and you need to come back. And the sort of awesome thing about this is that in the 1870s, this is actually possible, because before that, it was just way too damn far to bother with. And then you get steam power, and it's cheap, people moving back and forth all the time, and that is awesome. Um, so we actually know a lot about how people got ready to move to the empire, the sort of things they needed to bring with them, what they thought they were facing when they got out there, but we don't know as much about how people moved home, or what the impression was that was, um, which is just a comparison of these books there. Um, but people who went out to the tropics already had to be a very certain breed of people. These guidebooks really don't make it sound good. Um, this quote says, He who turns his back upon his fatherland for the purpose of proceeding to India goes forth to a land where cholera, dysentery, sunstroke, liver disorders, malarious fevers, and other diseases are rife, and from which comparatively few suffer at home. So you can look forward to fun stuff like snake bites, breakbone fever, which is as nasty as it sounds. And that's why people, you know, to get ready to go out, bought stuff like this. <laughs> um, which is, is wearing a mosquito net veil, modeling it, and I like that he has this pipe that's actually coming out of the... <laughs> because you can't smoke inside a mosquito net, that would be absolutely ridiculous. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, I think that's kind of fun, but you know, they were up against, they were up against a lot, and there was a lot of scary pictures of India, but actually, it turns out India is awesome. Um, it's really pretty, and most of the people who went out there had like an awesome time. These people are doing something with horses, and the colonists just partied. They partied and they drank, and 100% historically accurate. This is the main reason why they had liver diseases, because they drank too much. Um, so people were genuinely enjoying, you know, their life in India. So actually it was a bit of a letdown to come back to London, and that's, you know, that's where the guidebooks come in. So if you are going to decide to move back to London, what do you need to know? Where do you need to be? What are you going to wear? Um, and when I was reading this, I thought, you know, I think people can relate to that. So let, let's see what they've come up with. So the first thing that all these books do is just some serious expectation management. <laughs> so this says, remembering the numerous deadly diseases induced by noxious trades, the horrible filthy lodgings and dark alleys and crowded ill-drained towns, many Indian evils seem somewhat counterbalanced. So, you know, malaria is not so bad. You've got your, your helmet after all. 
Oh, this is, this is coming off the screen, and it says, oh, it's quite within the realm of possibility that you may, after all, experience a feeling of disappointment. Um, I would advise you first to not to raise your expectations too high. <laughs> and that's coming from a doctor, you guys. Um, so, yeah, don't get too excited. But, okay, you're coming back now. Where are you going to live? I mean, you would think logically you're going to move to the seaside. If you're sick, that makes sense. Places like Margate, you know, very popular for turning Indians. Um, Cheltenham, as a town, was populated mostly by old people who used to live in India interestingly. Um, but surprisingly, London, people thought, was quite a healthy place to come and live. Um, and one of the main reasons was this, that if you were coming back from India, you really didn't want to be bored. Depression was something that Indians struggled with a lot living in England. Um, and so they say the more and better in terms of fun is to be had from anyone's money worth in London than anywhere else in the world, to say nothing of the greater social and intellectual attractions, like history show off. Woo. <laughs> um, so yeah, London is going to be fun. So say you're moving to London, you want to get in on the fun, where are you going to live? Well, they recommend places you might expect, like Richmond, or Putney, or Highgate, or basically anywhere super nice. But the main place everyone wants to live is an area that was actually called Asia Minor at the time, um, which it says is the northwest area of just up north of Hyde Park. Um, and it affords considerable elevation as well as gravelly soil, houses of moderate construction, good drainage, open streets, and relatively few back slums. So this is Bayswater. Um, if you're not liking where you live in London now, you should just move to Bayswater because they have gravelly streets, which is what, what you're looking for, basically. So you've settled in Bayswater. What are you going to wear now that you're back? You're not going to keep wearing that mosquito helmet, right? Right? Uh, <laughs> they didn't actually, but the, these doctors were very critical about what English people wore, and I think he's got a point there. Um, they say these hats are wholly unfitted for the purpose which they're intended to answer. Like, <laughs> that doesn't keep you warm. It's not keeping the sun off of anyone's face. Um, so doctors actually recommended that you keep wearing pith helmets like this while you're back in town, and if you're a lady, you should use an umbrella for the same purpose. Um, and speaking of keeping warm, Th this one strikes particularly strongly for me. Um, it says, perhaps turning to joyous Christmas tide, you have pictured yourself on a glorious winter's day, a broad, crisp expanse of unsullied white around you. Or if you're American like me, and you watched a lot of Muppet Christmas Carol, you have an idea that London is going to look like this at Christmas time. Um, but he says, you've forgotten or ignored the cold, penetrating east winds, which seemingly, if only allowed to, appears even the innermost man. And you've forgotten the cold, cheerless days of October and November. Where the damp was enough to damp even the most cheerful temperament, and whose dense pea soup like fogs render gas at midday a necessity. We don't have the fogs necessarily. Um, but yeah, it's pretty fucking cold, especially compared to India. Also, it's really dirty. Like, nobody washes. And this, I mean, I guess not everybody looked like that, but it's still a time period where washing your hands and your face would have been like the standard of what would have been normal. To take a whole bath was something that was prescribed medicinally. It wasn't necessarily a daily routine thing. Um, but people who lived in India did this all the time. They sort of had to because it was really hot and sweaty and dirty. Um, so people moving back from India came up with ingenious ways to keep clean. Going to Turkish baths is one of them. This is a lady's diary and she's drawing her trip to the Turkish bath. Um, but another thing they did was they showered. Um, and they, they imported this new fangled thing called the shower bath. That's an advertisement for it, and pop made it popular in London. So if you have a shower in your apartment, that's because of Empire. <laughs> it always comes back to Empire. Um, but I think the overriding thing that comes across in these books is just that nobody gives a shit about you when you live in London. Especially if you've just come back from India, where basically you've been treated like royalty the whole time. Um, so this quote says, Another source of disappointment arises from a feeling that's experienced by all, but especially those who've held high and important positions, of their comparative insignificance as individuals in the busy world of, Lond of England, and London in particular. Fair enough. Um, as the illusion of their self-importance is dispelled, their self-esteem is shocked and they grow crotchety, peevish, and irritable. So it's just becoming Londoners, basically, the longer they stay here. Um, and however important they may have felt amongst salaming natives, Anglo-Indians will probably find themselves of little account amongst pushing Londoners. Um, and the, just something about this Victorian image here and that one there made me think, wow, times have not changed. So yeah, welcome back to London. Um, we may not have as much malaria, but yeah, it's, it's, there's some caveats to that. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Christian Hossie there.